بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so today إن شاء الله تعالى in light of the fact that we have a shorter class and also uh, next Wednesday as you know we're having uh, our iftar session or iftar uh, over here so we're going to have a very short khatira what I'm going to do is I, I wanted to give this talk actually from the beginning and uh, it's a good talk to give now before we move on and that is our beliefs regarding the Sahaba our beliefs regarding the Sahaba. This is a point of history, a point of theology, uh, a fundamental point of who we are as uh, Sunni Muslims, right? The, the, the point being that why do we as, as Sunni Muslims respect the companions the way that we do? So today's lecture <clears throat> is actually an introduction to the whole topic of the companions. And it should have been done when we started Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, but I think it's a perfect time now because we'll be pausing for a while. So... We began by talking about who exactly is a Sahabi. Who exactly is a Sahabi? What is the definition of a Sahabi? And in fact, in early Islam, this was a point of some controversy. That who exactly gets defined to be a companion? For example, uh, one of the early tabi'un, Sayyid ibn al-Musayyib, he was one of the students of the Sahaba. He said, we only consider a Sahabi somebody who lived with the Prophet for at least a year or two. And he participated with the Prophet ﷺ in at least one or two battles. Now, why would somebody make this definition? Because you see, when we talk about the Sahaba, the first people that come to mind are Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Talha. We think of the great Sahaba. But we need to understand that the bulk of the Sahaba are not of those whose names come to mind. Most of the Sahaba, we don't even know their names as we're going to come to. Most of the Sahaba, they simply were people who, maybe even from the Bedouins who came and visited Medina. A uh, simple example, every story that we ever come across in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ regarding Muslims, they are amongst the Sahaba. So the Bedouin who uh, urinated in the masjid, he's also a Sahabi, right? Even though this Bedouin has not narrated anything, his name is not even known, we don't know any blessings about him, but he constitutes the Sahabi, right? For example, the one who, uh, the, the Bedouins who raised their voices about the process and when Allah says in the Quran, لا ترفع أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي And they were calling out, Ya Muhammad, come and visit us. Come and see us. We're waiting for you. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are technically also Sahabi for us. But the early Tabi'un were hesitant to open this door. They didn't, some of them did not want to include those categories amongst the Sahaba. Right? They felt that that would be too much of a blessing for them. So they attempted to restrict it. And so they said, for example, as we said, Sayyid ibn Musayyib, he said, the Sahabi is somebody who at least he lives a year or two. Or he participates in one or two battles. Because participating in a battle boosts your level up to just living in Medina. Or even passing through. Remember we talked about the year of delegations. Many Sahaba, over at least four or 5,000 people, visited Medina for one day, two days, spoke to the process and went back. Are they included amongst the Sahaba or not? Some of the early scholars said, no, well, let's not include those types of people. They must have lived in Medina or they must have participated with the Prophet wasallam. However, as time went on, later scholars began incorporating more and more people into the term Sahaba until finally the standard definition that was embraced by the second century of Islam was we will take a Sahabi as anybody who linguistically can be called Sahabi. What does Sahabi mean? Sahabi means Sahiba, somebody. Sahiba, somebody, he becomes a uh, of the Ashab. So Sahiba means to accompany. Sahiba means to be with. This is linguistically what Sahiba means. To be with or to accompany. And therefore, Imam al-Bukhari, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam al-Bukhari in his uh, Sahih, he has a chapter heading. And that chapter heading says, whoever Sahiba, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or even saw him, is considered to be a Sahabi. So he takes the linguistic definition that whoever has any relationship directly with the Prophet wasallam is considered to be a Sahabi. And in fact, he brings a hadith that we will bring later on in today's lecture. And I'll mention that and I'll remind you this is the evidence that Imam al-Bukhari used. So based on this, the precise definition 
that was agreed upon in later Sunni Islam uh, is the definition that Ibn Hajar himself uh, proposed, or he doesn't propose it, but he, he codifies it, if you like. Ibn Hajar, the famous scholar of uh, Hadith, uh, and perhaps the grand muhaddith of the medieval times of Islam, he defined a Sahabi as anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while believing in him and then died upon Islam. Anybody who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while believing in him. So in the first condition, he met him. He didn't just hear about him, he met him. And by using the word met, Earlier, uh, people had said whoever saw the Prophet ﷺ. Even Bukhari mentioned whoever saw. But there were Sahaba who were blind. So by using the term meeting, this is more precise. So anybody who met the Prophet ﷺ while believing in him. So while believing in him, obviously means those who saw him and did not believe will not be considered a Sahabi. Likewise, those who saw him as a kafir then embraced Islam afterwards and never saw him after that, are not going to be considered Sahaba. And there was the famous uh, narration that I gave an entire lecture on, half a lecture on, of the Tanukhi man, who became the emissary between the Prophet ﷺ and Heraclius. And he came to see the three signs. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ asked him, why don't you embrace Islam? And he said, I'll think about it, but right now I have a job. I'm getting paid for a job. I'm not going to become a Muslim right now. And later on, he became a Muslim. This person is not considered a Sahabi then. Because he met the Prophet ﷺ, but he was not a Muslim at the time. And he then later embraces Islam, so he is, does not get the level of the Sahabi. He doesn't get those blessings of a Sahabi. So whoever meets the Prophet ﷺ while believing in him, this excludes as well those who don't physically meet him. When he's alive, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So anybody who sees the process in a dream does not become a sahabi. Because they didn't meet him while he's alive. Also, there's the record of at least one or two people, whose names even are mentioned, who saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's body on the day of his death. That they entered Medina, assuming to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Allah willed that he die on that day. And so there are... We know of some people, they prayed janaza over the Prophet Sallallahu but they did not see him when he's alive. So that doesn't make them a sahabi. Okay? So the definition is whoever sees or whoever meets the Prophet while believing in him and then dies upon Islam because there are a handful of hypocrites who at some point in their lives they claim to be Muslim and then they became murtad. They left the faith and especially amongst the movements that were the false prophets. A number of them uh, fall into this category, okay? Especially amongst the followers of the false prophets, some of them did indeed pretend to accept Islam, and they remained Muslim. Then when the uh, fitnas happened and the wars of Ridda, they embraced the faith of their tribal leaders. So these people are not considered uh, Sahabi. So therefore, anybody who met the Prophet ﷺ while believing in him and then died upon Islam. This is the definition of a Sahabi. Now, the Sahaba are not all one category. And this is something that everybody recognizes and understands. Why? Because the Qur'an itself categorizes the Sahaba. There are multiple verses in the Qur'an that categorize the Sahaba. Of those verses is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا وكلا وعد الله الحسنى They are not the same. Those who embraced Islam before the conquest and they fought battles, they cannot be the same as those who embraced Islam after the conquest. لا يستوي And Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى Both groups Allah has promised Husna. And Husna is one of the names of Jannah. Both groups Allah has promised Husna. But Allah clearly says not equal. Likewise, and we'll come to this verse again when we talk about the blessings of the Sahaba. Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And the earliest batches that won the race, the first groups of the Muhajirun and the Ansar, and then those who came after them. So Allah Azza wa Jal is clearly mentioning that when you embrace Islam, plays a big role in your status. So the earliest batches, 
have the highest level. And the Muhajirun have the highest. And then the Ansar have, because Allah mentions Muhajirun, then the Ansar. So Allah literally prefers the Muhajirun over the Ansar in the Quran by mentioning them first. But then Allah says all of them, Allah has promised good for. Okay? So based on this, early scholars fully understood that the Sahaba are of categories. They are not all the same category. And many scholars gave different categories, categorization schemes. Uh, some of them gave five categorizations. Some of them made it all the way up until 17. And I will quote you uh, the one that um, has become the most famous one. Uh, it was perhaps first proposed by uh, the famous scholar of uh, Hadith Al-Hakim, the author of Mustadrak, who died 405. And then it was narrated or accepted by most scholars, including Ibn Kathir and other scholars who made these 12 categories. This is the perhaps the most famous categorization. 12 categories of the Sahaba. And notice, by the way, as we're going to go over these 12 categories, these 12 categories are not fully distinct. Perhaps some Sahaba are in more than one category, so this gives them two blessings or two badges. Okay, So they're not completely unique. Rather, these are 12 categories that we can discern from the text of the Quran and Sunnah that have specific blessings or whatnot, and most of the Sahaba are in one category only but the more categories a Sahabi is in so the more blessed or the more uh, higher his rank is so these 12 are the first category those who accepted Islam from the beginning of Mecca earliest converts of Mecca and included in them is Abu Bakr and Uthman and Umar and Ali radiallahu they were the earliest batch Okay, the first batch of converts, the first few years of da'wah. Okay, this is the first category. The second category, those who accepted Islam in Darun Nadwa. So Darun Nadwa was established after a few years in Mecca. Okay, there were groups that converted even before that. That's the first category. The second category, those who converted in Darun Nadwa. Okay, and technically Umar bin Khattab is of this category that he converted in Darun Nadwa, but is also an early convert as well. So he is also included there, but he converted when there already was a Dar and Nadwa. So this is the second category that is the category of Darun Nadwa, those who embraced Islam when there was that uh, that Dar uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used. The third category, those who emigrated to Abyssinia, those who did Hijrah to Habasha. And our Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that they will get a double reward. They will get a double reward. Those who emigrated to Habasha will get a double reward. And there's a very famous tradition uh, in Sahih Muslim that Umar ibn Khattab uh, once was um, uh, talking to uh, Umm Salama and said to her, to Umm Salama, that, Oh Umm Salama, you know, don't... Uh, don't, with a long story, she was going to the, visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Umar was exiting from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, you know, don't think that you have a high status in the eyes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. While you were enjoying an easy life in Abyssinia, we were the ones protecting him in Mecca and Medina. Okay? So, because she was of the Abyssinian uh, emigrants. Okay? So you had it easy. You lived an easy life. And we were the ones with him, defending him, protecting him. And, and she became enraged. Umm Salma, she became enraged. And he said, La wallahi, you at least had him in your presence and company. And you could see him day and night. And we were all alone in a strange land, struggling with our iman, not having access to the Prophet wasallam, right? Being strangers in a land with a different language, different everything. At least you had the Prophet and amongst your own people. Right? And then she went immediately to the process and whatever her reason was for going was out the window. Now there's a new reason. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, Umar ibn Khattab said such and such. What do you think? Is that true or not? Right? Put him directly, like what is the thing? And the process said, you and the people who have emigrated to Habasha have double reward. You have ajran. Because you were the ones who emigrated to Abyssinia, then you came back and then you emigrated to Medina. You have two rewards. So Umm Salama went out, you know, telling everybody. And for the rest of the day, every single Habashi immigrant went and came to Umm Salama's house and said, I want to hear it from your mouth directly. What did the Prophet say about us? Right? So the Sahaba were so eager to get these blessings, every blessing that the Prophet gave them. 
and this is that's why they are considered in this category that those who emigrated to Abyssinia. The fourth and the fifth category, the fourth one is those who gave the first oath of Aqaba and the fifth one those who gave the second oath of Aqaba. So the fourth and fifth category is the beginning of the Ansar. Okay? And amongst the Ansar, the elite of the Ansar are who? Those who attended the first Aqaba. Then the second category of the Ansar, those who attended the second Aqaba, obviously. How many attended the first Aqaba? Please, everybody tell me you should know this. No, no, that's not the... Those were those who embraced Islam, the six. How many attended the first Aqaba? As the second Aqaba. Around 12. And the second Aqaba around 73, 72, 73. Okay? So those who attended these are considered to be the fourth and the fifth. The sixth category of Sahaba are the first batches who emigrated to Medina. When the Prophet Sallallahu was at Quba or while he was building the uh, masjid. So the Prophet uh, included in this, for example, is Ali. Uh, he, Ali, of course, is included in the first few as well and in this as well. That the Prophet is waiting for them to come. And small groups came at this time and they have an extra blessing that the Prophet waited for them. So uh, the sixth category, that those who emigrated while the Prophet waited for them at Quba or while he was building the masjid. The seventh category of Sahaba are the Badriyun. The Badriyun. And they are considered to be amongst the most elite of the Sahaba, 315 or so. And to be a Badri is the highest honor after the honor of being the first batches of converts. To be a Badri is the highest honor. And of course, all of the first batches of converts participated in Badr, except for Uthman radiallahu anhu, who had an excuse. Who had an excuse. Okay, so the, the seventh category, those who participated at Badr, and I went over so many ahadith about the blessings of the people of Badr. So uh, of them is uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has looked at the people of Badr, and he has said, do as you please, for you, all, you have all been forgiven. Do as you please, anything you do, it doesn't matter, you have been forgiven. Uh, and uh, of them is the hadith of Jibreel, that Jibreel asked the Prophet ﷺ that, uh, how do you view He asking the Prophet Sallam, How do you view those who participated at Badr amongst you And the Prophet said We view them as the best of us So Jibreel said Similarly the angels who participated at Badr We view them as the best of us Okay So the Sahaba who participated at Badr Are the best and the most elite of the Sahaba That's the seventh category The eighth category Those who emigrated between Badr and Hudaybiyah so that is around four and a half years between Badr and Hudaybiyah. Those who came in this stage, so they came from Mecca or from other lands, they came and they emigrated to Medina. This is the eighth category. The ninth category, those who participated in the Bay'at al-Ridwan. The Bay'at al-Ridwan. The Bay'at al-Ridwan is, of course, the oath of Hudaybiyah. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself testified for them and said Allah will forgive them, and Allah revealed Qur'an concerning them. And the Bay'at al-Ridwan had 1,400 people in it. And it is explicit in the Qur'an. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُبَايِعُونَكَ إِنَّمَا يُبَايِعُونَ اللَّهَ يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Those who give you their bay'ah in the Bay'at al-Ridwan, they are actually giving the bay'ah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's hand is over their hand. And regarding the Bay'at al-Ridwan, Allah says, Allah anhum wa radu anhu. Allah is pleased with them, they are pleased with Him. So everybody who participated in Bay'at al-Ridwan, Allah has said He is pleased with. Everyone, without exception. The entire 1,400, they are considered to be of the, of the elite of the Sahaba, and this is the, those who participated in Bay'at al-Ridwan. The 10th category of Sahaba, those who emigrated after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and before the conquest of Mecca. And this is the final batch of Muhajirun. Okay, this is the final batch of Muhajirun. And included in this are luminaries such as Khalid ibn al-Walid, Amr ibn al-As, and also those who didn't come necessarily from Mecca. There were batches that came from Yemen at this time. Most famous amongst them is Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Abu Hurairah emigrated from Yemen. He didn't come from Mecca. 
right? But he emigrated before the conquest. So he is considered a type of muhajir, not a Makki muhajir, a Yemeni muhajir. So he got the blessings of hijrah, even though he didn't emigrate from Mecca. He emigrated from Medina to live with the Prophet Wasallam, and he emigrated uh, basically between the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and the conquest of and the conquest of uh, Mecca. Uh, in fact, he came after the conquest of Khaybar. So after the conquest of Khaybar, that is when Abu Huraira came to Mecca, uh, sorry, to Medina, and he was with the Prophet ﷺ for at least a year before the conquest of Mecca. What number are we on now? Number 10. Number 11. Number 11 now. And this is the largest category. And it is those who converted after the conquest. They're just put in one category. And they number in the tens of thousands. Because included in this category are those who performed hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. So this category is the largest category. It overshadows the others by a factor of 100 or something. Because we do not know how many people attended the hajj, and we're going to come to this point as well. But they are considered to be, in the scale of things, on the lower side of the scale, but they are still Sahaba, and they were the ones who converted from the day of the conquest up until the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the 11th category. So what's left? What is the 12th category? The 12th category is a unique category, and that is young children who were not baligh, but they still saw the Prophet ﷺ. This is not toddlers and babies. Toddlers and babies who, whom the Prophet ﷺ saw are not considered Sahaba. They have a special uh, category in the books of tabaqat or ranks and it is mentioned that for example his mother came and the process and blessed him so he gets some blessing but he's not considered a sahabi because he doesn't remember meeting the prophet sallallahu okay he the young if it's a young boy you know one year old two year old infant a toddler and it was the sunnah uh, of the people of medina that any time a baby was born they would bring him to the process the next day the next morning so Every single baby born in Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ basically blessed the, the child. Okay, so it was their sunnah. The baby would be brought, and the Prophet ﷺ would basically make some dates or something, or even if there was nothing, just make du'a from or something. It was the sunnah uh, of the people of Medina and the Prophet ﷺ to do that. But that category is not considered sahabi, unless the child grew up and has memories. But if he's not baligh, then he's considered in this category. And that category is basically the young children who saw the Prophet Sallallahu and they have memories of him and they narrate. Now this is not people like Jabir and Ibn Abbas. They were young men. Jabir and Ibn Abbas and others, they were post bulu 12, 13, 14. That's basically, they've made it to the ranks of the other Sahaba. But there were those who were, so for example, um, uh, Abu Tufail Amir, uh, the one who, did, the, the very last Sahabi who ever died. He died 110 Hijrah. 110 Hijrah. Yani the very last Sahabi who ever died. So he was a young child. He died at the age of 105. And he was around 5 years old. And he remembers the Prophet ﷺ. So this is the last Sahabi to die. He doesn't have any hadith from him. He doesn't, but he remembers seeing the Prophet ﷺ. So this is that category of those young children who have memories of the Prophet ﷺ, but they didn't get to the level of actually narrating from him or learning from him, that's, that's why they're put in a special category, okay? So this is the primary categorization of the Sahaba. How many Sahaba are there? No one knows. And some of the early scholars of Islam attempted to give their numbers or at least numbers of categories amongst them. So Imam al-Shafi'i said there must be at least 60,000 of the Sahaba. And Imam Malik said that there are at least 10,000 Sahaba who lived in Medina when the Prophet ﷺ died. He's not talking about all the Sahaba. He's saying in Medina, he's estimating there must have been at least 10,000 people when the Prophet ﷺ died, which is actually a very, very uh, accurate ballpark figure. Okay, when the Prophet passes away, Medina is a city of around 10,000 people. And those 10,000, for sure, every one of them has interacted with the Prophet without doubt. Eid, khutbas, Jumu'ah, yani just being in Medina, how could you not? They're all Muslims. So you have 10,000 definitely who are in the city interacting with the Prophet. 
uh, Qatada, one of the students of Ibn Abbas, he's a tabi'i, he mentions that at least 1,500 Sahaba settled in the new city of Kufa. Kufa was to become the capital for a period of time. When did Kufa become the capital? Who can remind me? No, Umayyads don't have Kufa as the capital. Umayyads hated, and there was a big tension between the Iraqis and the Umayyads. Ali radiallahu anhu made Kufa the capital for a short period of time. Just for like four years, three and a half years, Kufa was the capital. Kufa was only the capital for the, the shortest capital in the history of the Ummah was Kufa. Uh, but because of that, and for other reasons, Kufa was a huge influx of Sahaba. 1,500 Sahaba emigrated to uh, Kufa. So all of this tells us there's thousands and thousands, but how many? The fact of the matter is we will never know. We hear figures of 100, 120 even is found in some of the early books. And... The fact of the matter is we will simply not be able to even guesstimate because the majority of this number goes back to the people who did Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu This is where the bulk of the number comes from. We know how many people were at Badr, at Uhud. We know how many people were at uh, in the conquest of Mecca. But there, there are battles that are beyond numbers. So for example, Tabuk. Tabuk, we do not know how many people. Because Tabuk was a battle that was fard ayn on every single sahabi. Remember, that's why the qissa of Tabuk and the repentance happened. And as the book said, uh, as the, uh, when we mentioned it, that the names of the people who went would not have been able to be written down in a registrar, sijil. You couldn't write all of those names down. So you have references of 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. So we have maybe 30,000 people going in Tabuk. That's a huge number. Think about it, right? So where are their names and what not? The fact of the matter is we barely have the names of even four to 5,000 Sahaba. And even those four to five, it is a great stretch. And uh, there are many attempts by our scholars to compile the names and biographies of the Sahaba. Many attempts. At least a dozen books have been written uh, in our history to compile the names of all of the Sahaba. Ibn Abdul Barr, uh, has al isti'af fi ma'rifat al ashab uh, and uh, other books as well, uh, Ust al Ghaba as well um, uh, by Ibn al Athir. But perhaps the most comprehensive book written to chronicle the names and biographies of the Sahaba is the famous book Al Isaba fi Tamyiz al Sahaba by none other than Ibn Hajar, the famous Ibn Hajar. Al-Isaba fi Tamyiz al-Sahaba. And uh, this was, by the way, one of my main sources for the seerah, by the way. Uh, every seerah class, I would always look up Al-Isaba, every Sahabi, and I would see any stories from there that I could put into the seerah. So Al-Isaba is the most fam- one of the most famous books uh, of the names of the narrators of the, of the sorry, the names of the Sahaba. And uh, in that book, we barely have four to 5,000 names of the Sahaba. And even these names, sometimes it's not even a name. It's like the one who was sent to this tribe. Maybe it's mentioned in a story, the Prophet ﷺ sent somebody, or this happened, or that happened. So it's not even the full name. Or it's just a kunya, Abu so-and-so, and we don't know anything else about him. So the bulk of this book really just has a name and maybe even one line. Not even, not even more than that. Therefore, the number of Sahaba who actually narrated from the Prophet ﷺ a hadith. So we're getting smaller and smaller. Imam uh, uh, Al-Hakim Mustadrak, the author of Mustadrak, he said around 4,000 Sahaba narrated from him. But the famous scholar Imam Al-Zahabi, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Al-Zahabi said, no, this cannot be correct. Perhaps 2,000 or maybe even 1,500 narrated from him. Ibn Kathir, the famous Ibn Kathir that all of us know, he said that the most comprehensive book of hadith is by Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. I, I mentioned it last uh, two classes ago, the uh, Musnad of Imam Ahmad. And despite the fact that Imam Ahmad is the most authoritative scholar of his time, and he has the rank that he does, he has traveled so much, despite all of this, he has narrated from only 978 companions. And if you go look up other books beyond this, you will not find more than two, three hundred other names. So the grand total is around 1,200 who narrated from him. And of those one, uh, this is me, this is not Ibn Kathir. Of those 1,200, literally only four or five narrated the bulk of the traditions. 
like only four or five Sahaba were the ones who excelled in narrating like 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, not 5,000, 3,000, 4,000 a hadith. Okay, Aisha and Jabir and Abu Huraira and Ibn, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas. These were the ones who became like the lions of narrating the ahadith. The bulk of our religion really is preserved by less than maybe 15 sahaba. They're the, the, those are the ones who became proficient in narrating the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the bottom line out of all of this before we move on is that perhaps... 90 to 95 percent of the Sahaba, they are really not known to us. We don't even know maybe even their names. The example of the Bedouin who urinated in the masjid is just one example. Imagine for that one Bedouin that urinated, how many tens of thousands would have crossed into Medina who have not done anything of that nature? We don't even know their names. Not even their tribes, nothing is known. Just rough estimates. And because they didn't narrate anything, so we have no knowledge of them uh, whatsoever. And only a very small percentage of the Sahaba are the ones whose names that we know. And an even smaller percentage are the ones who excelled in narrating the traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, we now move on to the next part of, of our lecture, and that is, what is the position of uh, us as Muslims towards the companions? And this is an issue of great controversy in early Islam and it remains an issue of controversy amongst the various groups and sects of uh, Islam today and in fact it is the hallmark or the defining feature of what we call Sunni Islam this is the one theological issue that defined Sunni Islam from its very beginning it wasn't over other issues, the first issue that defined Sunni Islam, what is your attitude towards the Sahaba? And every other movement and group differed with us. And they still differ with us. So we believe that it is an article of faith to respect the Sahaba. It's not just history. It is our aqidah, our theology, our iman. And to disrespect the Sahaba is something that hurts and harms our Iman. Why do we say this? Why did early Sunni Muslims refuse to join other movements and groups? And they made it a point of theology. From the perspective of those Muslims, and that's what we are as well in this masjid, alhamdulillah, and the bulk of the Muslim world, alhamdulillah, has always remained uh, Sunni. The Quran and Sunnah and common sense and unanimous consensus all prove this point. Quran, Sunnah, Aql, and Ijma. And these are the only sources of anything. So the Quran has so many verses. The Sunnah has mutawatir traditions and common sense, logic and reason, and unanimous consensus. All of these point to the same thing. As for the Quran, and I had to choose uh, a few verses, the reality is there are too many verses to do in even a few lectures. There's too many verses. I'll cho I chose seven of them for today's lecture. Uh, and these are verses that all of you should be aware of. And this is very useful. If you meet somebody who doesn't respect the Sahaba, you should know these verses. Uh, quite explicit in the Quran. I, I, I chose verses that I thought would be the most useful in our dialogues with perhaps other movements and whatnot who do not respect the Sahaba. Uh, the first of these verses is the famous verse uh, of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلِ النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ رَسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And this is our decree. كَذَلِكَ here means this is our will. This is it. This is the decree. What is the decree? We have made you the wasat nation. Now, the wasat, the word wasat has two meanings to it. The first meaning is the best. And the second meaning is the middle. And these two meanings are complementary because generally speaking, the best of the, the crowd is surrounded by the crowd. He comes into the middle. Generally speaking, the leader is surrounded by the entourage. He's in the middle. The imam is in the middle. So being in the middle here indicates that you are surrounded by others they are showing you respect. So the word wasat has both meanings and they are interconnected. 
The first meaning is the middle nation, and the second meaning is the best, because the best is the middle, and the middle is the best in this regard. Okay, and even in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, "Qala aw satuhum alam akulakum la lutsabiyun." The one in the middle said, "Why didn't you praise Allah?" But it's not the one in the middle; it's the best of them said, "Why didn't you praise Allah?" Qala aw satuhum. The best of them said, "Why didn't you praise Allah?" Subhanahu wa taala. This is the story. Which story is this? Do you know which story is it? Ashabul Jannah. There's two Ashabul Jannahs in the Quran. Which one? Surah Al-Qalam Ashabul Jannah. Not Surah Al-Kahf Ashabul Jannah. There's uh, Ashabul Jannah of Kahf. And then there's uh, Surah Noon. Has also the Jannah. So there's two gardens that are parables and, or stories in the Quran. So in any case, where was I? So um, the, the issue, Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatun ukhrirtinas. Now, we have always heard this ayah being used to describe us as Muslims versus the other nations. And this is valid. There's nothing wrong with that. But pause here. When this verse came down, who is it applying to? The Sahaba. The primary application of the verse is not me and you. When this verse is coming down, Allah is addressing a live audience. And he's speaking to them directly. And Allah is saying, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. So this ayah is an explicit ayah that praises all of the Sahaba. And it affirms exactly one of the hadith we're going to do in 10 minutes. And that is, Khayrun nasi qarni. The best of all people is my generation. And that's the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And this is the verse in Sahih Bukhari. Kuntum khayra umma. And the hadith, khayrun nasi qarni. Exactly complementing one another. So this is the first evidence, Surah Baqarah, verse 143. The second evidence, Surah Ali Imran, verse 110. Surah Ali Imran, verse 110. And it is the same as Surah Baqarah, that Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَصَدَى Similar thing that Allah says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ للناس. I misquoted sometimes I'm quoting that ayah a few minutes ago. But this is the ayah of Surah Al-Imran. Surah Baqarah is, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَصَدَى Surah Al-Imran, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ للناس. You are the best ummah that has been sent to mankind. So Allah is addressing the Sahaba. You are the Ummah and Wasata, you are the Khayru Ummah. And literally it is applying to those who are alive and believing in the Quran when it comes down. And that's all of the Sahaba. Therefore, Allah has called the Sahaba the best and the most middle and the highest ranking. Those who believe in the Quran. Of the evidences as well is Surat Anfal. Surat Anfal verses 72. 72 to 74. 72 to 74. In Surah Al-Anfal 72 to 74, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا Sorry. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا Those who believe and emigrate and fight with their money and their, and their selves in the way of Allah and those who helped them and comforted them i.e. the muhajirun and the ansar. The two of them are helpers of one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on until he says, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّى So Surah Anfal verses 72 all the way to 74. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّى These people, who are they? Those who believed in you, those who fought, those who gave of their money, those who helped the people doing this. These are the real believers. So anybody who believed in the Prophet ﷺ when this verse comes down and he fights with the Prophet ﷺ and he gives of his money to the Prophet ﷺ and he helps the cause of Islam at this time, Allah is saying, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّى So Allah Himself has said that the truest believers are the Sahaba. You cannot get higher than the Sahaba. They are the Haqq believers. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّى and Allah says uh, that Allah has promised for them مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كريم, A great forgiveness and a great uh, reward. So in the Qur'an, the Sahaba are called the only true believers. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّ 
And this means no one can reach that level. Because when Allah says they have achieved the reality of Iman, so then they have achieved a level nobody else can achieve. Of the uh, evidences in the Quran as well uh, is uh, Surah at Tawbah, verse 100. Surah at Tawbah, verse 100. And Surah Tawbah, verse 100, are already quoted at the beginning uh, of, of the lecture. رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه وأعد لهم جنات تجي من تحت الهر الخالدين فيها أبدا ذلك الفوز العظيم السابقون الأولون the ones who converted at the very beginning the earliest of the early from both the muhajirun and the ansar and then those who followed them so you know those 12 categories not all of them are the same so the earliest batches and then those who followed them in righteousness those are the people Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. So when we say Abu Bakr radiyallahu an, Umar radiyallahu an, where are we getting this phrase radiyallahu an? Straight from the Quran. In over half a dozen verses. And it's only applied, or I should say primarily applied for the Sahaba. Almost exclusive, one or two times others, but otherwise it's always only for the Sahaba. Radiyallahu anhum wa radu anhu. That's why we say Abu Bakr radiyallahu an, Umar radiyallahu an. Because Allah has said, رضي الله عنهم. So if Allah is content with them, and they are content with Him, which means Allah is affirming their iman. Allah is saying, I'm happy with them, they are happy with me. رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه. So in this verse, once again, we learn السابقون الأولون, the earliest of the early, from the muhajirun and the ansar. Allah is pleased with them, and Allah has promised them uh, Jannah. So this is verse number what? Fourth, right? Fourth. The fifth verse that we're going to do, Surah Fatah, verse 29. Surah Fatah, verse 29. And Surah Fatah, verse 29, is another famous passage in the Quran. Muhammadur Rasulullah. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَارِ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ Muhammadur Rasulullah. Muhammad وسلم, is Rasulullah. This is the only time in the Quran where this phrase occurs in this form, in the standard form, Muhammad Rasulullah. This is the only time. Right after the second part of the kalima, Allah praises the Sahaba. And this in and of itself is to show you how great the Sahaba are. The only time the second kalima occurs in that form, Muhammad Rasulullah, in that form, of course it occurs in other ways, but in that form is the only time. Then Allah says, and those who are with him, وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ So this is the Sahaba. This is the Sahaba. And then Allah praises them and describes them uh, w- uh, f- that, that this is their example in the Torah, this is their example in the Injil, uh, meaning I have already talked about the status of this group in the Torah and in the Injil, and that Allah has prepared for them gardens uh, under which uh, uh, um, rivers are flowing. So once again, this, the, the point being, in this verse, the Sahaba are praised, and Allah says, I am pleased with them, they are pleased with me. And in fact, in this verse, Allah says, I have also mentioned their praise in the Torah and in the Injil. So we can say the status of the Sahaba, Allah predicted it and mentioned it even in the Torah and in the Injil. The uh, sixth verse, the sixth verse, Surah Hujurat, verse 7. Surah Hujurat, verse 7. وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And know that you have amongst you the Prophet of Allah. So clearly, who is the recipient of this ayah? It's the Sahaba. So they're the ones who have the process amongst them. وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنْ أَمْلِي لَعَنِدْتُمْ If he were to place much burden on you, you couldn't handle it. You would have become frustrated. You would have become tired. But what has happened? وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِصْيَانِ أُولَاكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ This is of the highest praises of the Sahaba. Allah has written love of Iman in your hearts and made Iman beautiful for you and He has caused you to hate kufr and evil and disobedience to Allah, these are the rightly guided. Clearly, who are the rightly guided? 
the ones who have the Prophet living amongst them. So Allah testifies, I am the one that has cleansed your hearts and made iman beloved unto you. And again, ev any one of these verses would be explicit enough. We have so many and then even more than what I'm going to quote you today. The final verse I'm going to quote you is verse Tahrim, Surah Tahrim, verse 8. Surah Tahrim, verse 8, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ لَا يُخْزِ اللَّهُ النَّبِيَّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا معه. On that day, the day of judgment, Allah will not humiliate the Prophet, nor will He humiliate those who believed with Him. Those who believed with Him, وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ so the Sahaba are referenced here. Then Allah goes on and He says that, uh, Their light is going out in front of them. And they are saying, Oh Allah, perfect our light. So once again, the Sahaba are praised. And Allah says, I will not humiliate you on the day of judgment. Now, these are seven verses I quoted you. And the fact of the matter is there are at least triple this amount that are explicit about the Sahaba. Not to mention the verses that apply to specific groups of the Sahaba. For example, the Badr. For example, the people of uh, uh, the conquest of Mecca. For example, the, the, the people who participated, uh, who responded to the call. Those who responded from Uhud. So those who responded are praised. There are dozens of verses that praise specific Sahaba. Even Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is praised in at least a dozen verses. But we're going to leave those aside. Every verse I quoted you is one that applies to all of the Sahaba, generically. As for the Ahadith, again, too numerous to mention. And in fact, most books of hadith has special chapters about the blessings of the Sahaba. So Sahih Bukhari has an entire Kitabu Fadail al-Sahaba. Sahih Muslim has a whole Fadail al-Sahaba. And a Tirmidhi and a Nisa'i. And in fact, there are even booklets written by some of the classical scholars of hadith. The book of the blessings of the Sahaba. The book that narrates the blessings of the Sahaba. Imam Ahmad and his son wrote a book of the Fadail al-Sahaba. So we have two numerous to mention. And that is why, the, one of the reasons why Sunni Islam is called Sunni Islam is that you cannot affirm the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and disrespect the Sahaba. Because the Sunnah is full of praise of the Sahaba. So if you believe in the Sunnah, you will praise the Sahaba. So you are a Sunni. That is why no other movement has books of hadith other than we, us. No other trend or group has hadith the way that we do. Because if you believe in hadith, you're going to affirm respect for the sahaba. Simple as that. And if you don't believe in hadith, well then, you're not a Sunni, right? You're not following the sunnah. So Sunni means following the uh, sunnah. And of course, by the way, the broader term is ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. And a lot of people ask, where did this come from? And it seems that it goes back to the time of the late sahaba. Perhaps Ibn Abbas, there are narrations from Ibn Abbas that uh, when the Khawarij appeared. Uh, so um, he, the a terminology had to be invented to distinguish them from the Khawarij. And so the term Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah was coined, uh, but it, it became in vogue in the time of the Tabi'un, in the time of the second generation. And the meaning of Ahl sunnah they are following the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam because the Khawarij didn't follow the Sunnah. And the other movements, the Mu'tazila, the Rafida, did not follow the Sunnah. And Jama'ah here, means the group of Sahaba. The jama'a means group. And the group here is the Sahaba. So the reason why we are called Sunni Muslims is because we respect the Sahaba. The, our term itself goes back to respecting the uh, Sahaba. So as for the hadith, there are two numerous to mention. I will mention only uh, five of them uh, today that again I thought were more comprehensive. Um, of those uh, hadith, uh, the most famous of them and the most obvious of them our Prophet ﷺ said, Mutafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim, that Khairun Nasi Qarni, Thumma Ladina Ilunahum, Thumma Ladina Ilunahum. The best of all mankind is my generation. Then the generation to come, then the generation to come. So this is a simple, sweet, to the point. From the history of mankind, we believe as Muslims, no generation has come greater than the generation of the Sahaba. And you look at history. The followers of Isa were few in number, very few. The followers of Musa, 
as we know, the Bani Israel had a lot of tensions. They did many things here and there. Our Prophet was blessed with the largest and the most copious and the quality and the sincerity. No other Prophet had this. So, خَيْرٌ nasi qarni. So in the history of mankind, the best generation was that of the Sahaba. Uh, the second hadith that we'll do, our Prophet ﷺ said, that, uh, and this is a cryptic hadith, I'll decipher it for you. النُّجُومُ أَمَنَةِ sama. The stars are the protectors of the heavens. So when the stars disappear, the skies will face what is destined for them. And I am the protectors for the companions. When I disappear or go away, then what is decreed for the Sahaba will come to them. And the Sahaba are the protectors of my Ummah. And when they disappear, then what is decreed for my Ummah will come to them. And this hadith is Sahih Muslim and Muslim Muhammad and others, and it is clearly authentic. The meaning of the stars are the protectors of the heavens is that they, that the stars are somehow protecting the heavens from destruction. And when the stars disappear, then the heavens will also be destroyed. This is a metaphysical or physical thing. Maybe the astronomers can talk about it and clearly there's something going to happen. Towards the Qiyamah time, the stars will, will disappear. And the Quran mentions this as well, when the stars are going to be folded up and disappear. So when the stars disappear, Qiyamah is close by. Then the Prophet said, and I am the protector of my companions. When I go away, things are going to happen to them that Allah has decreed. Not very good. Some calamities will happen. And this is what? The fitna between the Sahaba. This is the warfare between the Sahaba. So it happened to them. The Sahaba are the protectors of my Ummah. When they go away, what has been destined for my Ummah will come to it. No matter what happened at the time of the Sahaba, we had Izzah, we had glory. And these differences between them, when you look back, look at what's happening now, and it's trivial. So when the Sahaba leave, the Prophet said, what is decreed for my ummah is going to come. And that shows us the Sahaba are the protectors of my ummah. That's the main phrase for us we need to uh, concentrate on. The third hadith, a very interesting one, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, Muttafaq Ali. And it is one of the most famous hadith as well. Uh, and it involves a story about Khalid ibn al-Walid getting irritated with Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And this was when Khalid was a brand new convert and he came back from the battle of Mu'tah. And he was a brand new uh, convert. And Khalid gave some harsh words to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And there are both Sahaba. But Abdurrahman ibn Auf is of the ten Ashra Mubashara. And Khalid ibn Walid is of those who converted right before the Fath Makkah. The last batch who converted before the Fath. So the Prophet ﷺ rebuked Khalid ibn walid And he said in that famous hadith, لا تسبوا أصحابي Do not revile my companions. Do not do sab or cursing my companions. For wallahi, if one of you were to give the mountain of Uhud as gold, fi sabilillah, it would not equal a handful of wheat that one of them gave, or even half of a handful. This hadith is Bukhari and Muslim. Now this hadith is really powerful for so many reasons. Why? Well, firstly, who is the Prophet speaking to? Khalid ibn al-Walid. Contrasting Khalid, a later convert, to, and not just any later convert, somebody who he himself called Saifun min Sayyufillah. But still, Khalid cannot be compared to the first ten. So, if between these two there is such disparity in rank, then where do I stand and you stand? Khalid ibn Walid is being told. If you manage to give the mountain of Uhud, you know, mountain of Uhud, I have said, is a whole range of mountains, two and a half, three kilometers. If you could give that as gold at this stage now, it would not equal a handful of barley or wheat that one of them gave, not even a half of it. Why? Because when did they embrace Islam and when did you embrace? What did they have to suffer and what do you have to suffer? Their sincerity 
and their dedication has no comparison with anything that you now do once Islam is powerful and established. So if this is being told to Khalid ibn al-Walid, where do we stand on the scale? Right? So this hadith is extremely powerful about the status of the Sahaba and it's an explicit hadith. Do not speak ill of my companions. لا تسب أصحابي Even though what Khalid said was not what we would call cursing, but it was just not very, it was harsh and derogatory. It's not actual sab sab, يعني like, you know, la'an and curse. No, it wasn't like that, but it was still harsh. And the Prophet said, don't do this. And this shows us, therefore, as Sunni Muslims, we keep our mouths pure. Our tongues are absolutely clean when it comes to speaking about the Sahaba. We either say good or we remain quiet. We do not say anything bad about the uh, Sahaba. And uh, one other hadith um, that we'll do uh, is the uh, famous hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. Allah, Allah fi ashabi. Allah, Allah fi ashabi. Allah, Allah, this is a, f- uh, a way of uh, Arabic that is, it basically means remember Allah, fear Allah, recall Allah when it comes to my ashab. Allah, Allah fi ashabi. Okay, think of Allah about my sahaba. Meaning, be careful about my sahaba. Remember Allah when you speak about my sahaba. Do not take them as targets after me. So whoever loves them, has loved them because of my love. And whoever hates them, has hated them by hating me. فَمَنْ أَحَبَّهُمْ فَبِحُبِّ حُبَّهُمْ وَمَنْ أَبْغَضَهُمْ فَبِبُغْضِ أَبْغَضَهُمْ in other words, in this hadith, our Prophet is linking loving the Sahaba to loving him. And hating the Sahaba, he himself has linked it to hating him. And this is a very scary hadith to those who hate the Sahaba. That whoever despises the Sahaba, he is despising them by despising me. So this hadith clearly demonstrates once again the status of the Sahaba. And the fifth and final hadith that we'll do is the all of the ahadith that praise the Ansar alone. And I mention this because we have gone over them. Uh, and of those hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is mutafaq ali Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ayatul imani hubbul ansar wa ayatul nifaq awul kufri bughdul ansar. The sign of iman is to love the Ansar. And the sign of kufr or nifaq is to hate the Ansar. This hadith is Bukhari and Muslim. And all of the other hadith about praising the Ansar. And we know from the Quran that the Muhajirun are higher than the Ansar. So if the Muhajirun are higher than the Ansar, and a sign of Iman is to love the Ansar, so then a sign of Iman is to love the Sahaba. The sign of Iman is to love the Sahaba. And as for unanimous consensus and statements of the Sahaba, again, so much can be said. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, Allah looked at the hearts of mankind and he saw the best heart, the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he chose that heart to be his messenger and he sent him to the people. Then he looked at mankind and he chose the next best hearts to be the hearts of the Ansar and the uh, uh, helpers of the Prophet ﷺ. by Ansar here, he doesn't just mean the Ansar, he means anybody who helped the Prophet ﷺ. and so he chose them to be his helpers and his aid. So, whatever the Muslims, meaning the Sahaba, see as good, it is good in the eyes of Allah, and whatever, whatever the Muslims see as bad, it is bad in the eyes of Allah. And this is Ibn Mas'ud, and I can quote you at least two dozen other narrations from the Sahaba and Tabi'un that talk about the status of the Sahaba, and it is something that is mutawatir from them. As for common sense and reason and logic, then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the last prophet and the best prophet, then he must also give that last prophet and the best prophet the best of all followers, the best of all people surrounding them. It does not make any sense that the best of all people is going to be surrounded by the worst of all people, which is the claim of some groups of Islam. In fact, it is an insult to Allah and His Messenger to claim this. Because by their fruits you shall know them. The pure the heart, the pure the people attracted to that heart. And the more filthy the heart, the more filthy the people attracted to that heart. Correct? 
So, when the purest of the pure, the Prophet ﷺ is sent, who's going to be attracted to him? Who's going to be following? Who's going to be defending? The purest of the pure. Who will Allah choose to be the defenders of the Prophet ﷺ, the best of the best? Likewise, if you criticize the Sahaba, you have no basis even to be a Muslim anymore. But what do I mean by this? I'm not making takfir, I'm saying, what do I mean by this? Who told you what is the Quran? Who told you what is Islam? Who told you how to pray? Who told you each and every detail you need to know about everything of your religion? The Sahaba. If you consider the Sahaba to be not righteous, you have no religion left. Literally, you have no religion left. Think about it. If you're going to consider the Sahaba to be untrustworthy, they disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ, then you have no Islam left to trust. Where do you get your Islam from? If you're not going to get it from the Sahaba. And therefore, the one who doubts the Sahaba, in reality, this will lead to doubting the entire religion of Islam. And that is why we conclude, time is almost up, there is much more left as to summarize. We conclude by stating that it is a part of our theology, our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we respect the Sahaba, that we ask Allah's blessings and forgiveness for them, that we defend their honor, that we affirm their trustworthiness. And this means we do not doubt their overall sincerity. We are not saying that the Sahaba are ma'asum. Ma'asum means sinless without a fault. That is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu That he is ma'asum from any major sin, from falling into any mistake. That's the Prophet sallallahu An individual Sahabi can and will commit mistakes and sins. He's human at the end of the day. But those mistakes and sins will not be to harm Islam. That is what we mean when we say we affirm their trustworthiness. They will never do anything to harm the religion of Islam. They might have their personal faults, and they do. We have Sahaba who did some things and sins that are not very positive. That's the reality of humans, right? And some of those mistakes might even lead to anger, might even lead to warfare between them. But those are personal issues. And our methodology is we remain silent about what happened between the Sahaba and we assume the best and we keep our tongues free and clean of saying anything negative about them. And the final point, which is a very convoluted point, I'm going to have to just quickly mention it. There is a controversy uh, amongst uh, our scholars regarding those who reject the Sahaba. Are they even Muslim or not? And some of our ulama have said, anybody who curses the Sahaba cannot be considered a Muslim. And the reason they say this is because when Allah says, radiyallahu anhum, and when Allah says, ulaika humul mu'nuna haqqa, and when Allah says all of these verses, then somebody comes and curses, these ulama said, it is as if he's rejecting what Allah has said. And this is a very well-known position, that anybody who curses the Sahaba cannot be considered a Muslim. And the other position, which is also found in our heritage and tradition, and also many of our ulama said it, is that the one who curses the Sahaba has committed a major sin and a major bid'ah, and it is a stepping stone to rejecting Islam, but it is not in and of itself rejecting Islam. And this is my position as well. And the evidences are beyond the scope of this class, but it is my opinion that uh, the one who curses the Sahaba, uh, this person is an evil person. He's a bad person. And his heart has to have something wrong in it. And he cannot be of a pure theology. But it doesn't in and of itself make him a kafir. However, there is one exception. And that is if somebody doubts the chastity of our mother Haisha. That is the one exception that there is no known difference of opinion. Because the Quran has been explicit, 20 verses were revealed, and it is impugning the honor of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu directly to speak about his wife in this manner. So anybody who crosses that red line, then we say this person cannot claim allegiance to Islam anymore. Is that clear? Okay, I don't have to go into explicit detail what I mean here. It's very clear. But to ridicule and to curse and to mock 
other than this, we say this is an evil person whose heart has disease in it, that he is not rightly guided, that he has fallen into one of the worst bid'as, but in and of itself to denigrate some of the Sahaba, because that group obviously does not denigrate all of the Sahaba. They have certain Sahaba that they admire, Ammar ibn Yasir and Salman al farsi they consider them to be, but the rest of them, there's difference amongst their, their, own, their own. So within that group, there are those that are extremist right wing, and there are those that are more moderate, and then there are those that are reconciliated. And then you have the awam, the masses who really don't know anything. So we don't make a blanket judgment on all of them. We say those who go to these vile and vulgar things to curse and whatnot, these people are evil. And they are not rightly guided, and Allah will deal with them, and they are facing a major punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why every single group that was not Sunni, the Mu'tazila, the Khawarij, the uh, Rafida Shia, uh, these are the three main groups, and the Jahmiya early on, and the Murji'a and the Qadariya, all of these are early, early groups. Every one of them made it a point of doctrine that they don't care what the Sahaba says. They didn't consider the Sahaba to be worthy of respect. And the only group that considered the Sahaba worthy of respect were the group that eventually now became Sunni Muslims. So the Sunni Islam, and the irony here, I keep on saying I'll conclude, but uh, keep the, the irony here, within Sunni Islam, there are so many theological movements. And you have all types of groups within Sunni Islam now. From the hardcore Sufis to the hardcore Salafis, you have all of these trends in between. And within themselves, they differ about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His names and attributes. They differ about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and how to understand his sunnah. They differ even about issues of qadr, slightly within Sunni Islam. But the one issue that every Sunni group agrees upon, from the hardcore Bayilvi to the hardcore Salafi to the Deobandi to everybody in the middle, which is really interesting, respect of the Sahaba. It's really interesting to think about. That the one theological principle that still unites Sunni Islam, all strands of it, it's not even how we believe in Allah. It's not even how we worship Allah. Because within Sunni Islam, there's so many, you know. It's not even the status of the Prophet in the sense, as we know, some groups say he was not even human, he's Nur. Nuri Ilahi, right? What is the word Nuri Ilahi? What is the term they use? What's the term they use? Huh? That... that just from the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is even within you know, Sunni Islam. We have this, right? He didn't cast a shadow, correct? They have this theology. He did not cast a shadow. He did not eat and drink. He was superhuman. This is within Sunni Islam. But ironically, Qadr Allah, the one thing that no Sunni movement has ever rejected is the status of the Sahaba. And I find this intriguing that everything else has even differed over but not the issue of the Sahaba. And therefore, uh, we as well follow along in this, and we believe the Qur'an and the Sunnah and unanimous consensus and common sense and logic and rationality, all of it proves to us that respecting the Sahaba and not speaking ill of them and not doubting their intentions for Islam is a part of theology and iman in Allah. And to go against this is a weakness or maybe even a destruction of our Iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are resurrected with the Sahaba and are with the Sahaba in Jannatul Firdaus Al A'la. Any quick questions, inshallah, before uh, we conclude? Yes, Bismillah. Sirat al Ladina An'amta alayhim is also a direct reference to the Sahaba, yes. Uh, because the uh, but it's it's a direct reference that the, the tabi'un themselves said, but it's not as explicit as the ones I quoted, because an'amta alayhim is more than just the sahaba. But there's no doubt that the primary group, when this ayah came down again, who are those who are the rightly guided and whom Allah has blessed? It is the sahaba, and it has been interpreted by many tab, many tabi'un that an'amta alayhim here is a reference to the sahaba, and in fact was it. One tabi'i, was it Hassan al-Basri or somebody who said, this is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. An'amta alayhim is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Not just any Sahabi, but Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So, yes, this is a correct interpretation that we find in the earliest of tafsir. Okay. In the beginning of your talk, you indicated that the Sahaba that were in 
الارقم ولا لا يسي اوكي جزاك الله خير اوكي جزاك الله خير اوف كورس ام ا هيومن بينج از ويل اي ميك بلانتي اوف ميستيكس اند سليب اوف ذا تونغ دار الارقم اوف كورس دار الارقم دار الارقم نوت دار الندوه دار الارقم اذر كويستشنز So inshallah, the announcement for next Tuesday, we have our class at 8 o'clock. And then next Wednesday, it's the 9th. And I hope, inshallah, all of us will be fasting uh, if you're able to. Even if you're not able to, just come and join us. Inshallah, we'll be having a iftar here at MIC, inshallah. And then we'll come back before Isha and have a short يعني, khatir or something for the, before the Isha. As well, the timing of Isha Salah from now on, from tomorrow, will be 8.30 p.m. From tomorrow, 8.30 p.m., inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and Fajr from Saturday will be 6 p.m., right? I said it again, 6 a.m., see? I wanted p.m., huh? I said 6 a.m. From Saturday will be 6. Uh, did you send the email out? No? Okay. Okay, inshallah, we'll do that. Inshallah, we'll break now for Salat al-Isha, inshallah. Bismillah.